around the metal space uh, is quite active as the year draws to a close, simply because the Western world is seemingly headed into a recessionary slowdown, if not an actual recession. But at the same time, we have China opening up and India's growth prospects, while appear strong, might be under a bit of a question mark in the wake of what's happening in the West. So in, in light of all of this, it becomes important to figure out what the tug of war could hold in store for 2023. To talk about that, we have Mr. Bimlin Raja. He's MD of Jindal Steel and Power, joins us right now on the show. Mr. Jai, good having you. Thanks for joining in. Good, uh, good morning, uh, Neeraj. Uh, nice to talk to you. Likewise. Uh, how does this, to your mind, how does this tug of war between a Western slowdown versus a China reopening impact fortunes for steel demand and, and the numbers for steel companies? So first of all, if you look at the world, its manufacturing base is China. So uh, if China opens up from steel demand perspective, the world opens up. It's uh, not so important to look at anywhere else uh, in terms of the sheer weight of China, in terms of both steel production and consumption. So COVID restrictions being lifted, we have seen an immediate impact on the prices moving up. And world benchmark is actually being set more by China than any other Western economy. So even if there are recessionary trends or uh, a slight slowdown in demand on the Western front, uh, it is more than compensated by China. Interesting. We did see this morning or overnight in the last 12 to 18 odd hours, um, one of your peers, JSW Steel, increased the HRC prices as well. Tell us a bit about how pricing has shaped up because I heard you mention in the opening answer that there is an immediate impact seen on global steel prices as a result of China opening up. So if you look at uh, any pricing by anybody in the world, I said that China has a great influence because the world prices then set the benchmark and everybody else sort of follows it. India has been relatively isolated and uh, particularly those products which are sold more domestically than uh, which travel abroad. So uh, if JSW has taken their actions, I can't comment on it. Uh, as far as uh, we are concerned at JSPL, we look at a strong demand domestically and uh, we do see bottoming out of the prices that are happening in India. And they have a very strong reason to be so. A, previously in other interviews, I have stated that this is the best season for the construction and infrastructure activity in India. All the festive season is over. There are no rains. We are going ahead and having a very robust demand for infrastructure and construction. And going forward, uh, next quarter for sure, and the quarter after that, at least uh, two months of that is without any rains. So this is one of the best uh, six months uh, period that one gets during the year where there is strong demand, there are budgetary allocations that have to be exhausted by uh, different agencies, and therefore people are uh, keen to buy things, keen to uh, spend the money on construction and infrastructure. So from that perspective, we look at a very strong quarter ahead. Mm, interesting. Uh, so, okay, have you taken any pricing actions, Mr. Jha? No, we are not uh, taking pricing actions based on international prices, as I said. Our pricing is more uh, related to the demand and supply, and therefore we also see lesser volatility in our prices. Uh, in, uh, if you look at the hot rolled coils, they have shown far greater volatility compared to the long products. And JSPL being more focused on long products, even though plates are technically flat products, but they go into construction and infrastructure. And therefore, uh, we, we see greater stability. There is a strong demand for plates also from yellow goods sector. So we, uh, we are not taking any uh, knee-jerk reaction-based pricing uh, decisions, particularly uh, from what has what we have seen China doing over the last one week or so. But you reckon that if indeed 
Well, and, and, and the debate around the China property sector is still split right down the middle about the extent of the pullback that it can show. But that notwithstanding, am I to understand that you believe that by and large, there could be strength in demand, both domestic and global, and therefore there is a scope, a higher probability of prices moving up over the course of the next two to three months, as opposed to staying steady. So like if you really look at the steel industry, there are two, uh, two forces that determine these prices. Mm -hmm. One is, of course, the demand side of things that you're talking about. But the other one comes from the uh, pressure from the uh, supply side of raw materials. And raw material prices do get influenced when there is a huge demand for steel production. So my expectation is that there is a possibility that it might so happen that some of the raw material prices, if they are strengthened, uh, that will put a rock bottom number on the, uh, on the steel prices. That means prices should bottom out and that would be led more by the cost side of equation. The demand side of equation, uh, it also has two factors. One factor is the uh, genuine demand that goes up. The second factor is inventories. So sometimes when people have held back their buying, uh, then the inventories are too low. And then they can't hold it back for too long a time. That is when there is disproportionate rise in prices that takes place. And this is where it becomes highly unpredictable uh, in terms of what is likely to happen because of the combination of factors. So that's what I, I would say. And this is, this is why nobody has a great crystal ball in steel industry. If you see, uh, no matter what kind of experience people have, uh, people typically go wrong in their predictions. So I, I don't have any better crystal ball. Okay, but, but so are we in that unpredictable zone or you are just refraining from predicting because the chances are, you know, I mean, the, the ability to predict is, is, is difficult per se. Oh, uh, as my personal uh, behavior on this is concerned, uh, I tend not to predict and focus on things that I can control. And uh, I can focus on the efficiencies and we are an efficient player. I focus on customer service. Uh, I focus on making sure that the demand is uh, completely catered to by being ready to fulfill that demand by making sure that all our uh, uh, all our maintenance are taken care of well in advance. A lean season is typically utilized for that. So we are ready to leverage when there is good demand and be efficient uh, no matter where the prices sit, but remain efficient to take advantage of uh, your own efficiencies. Okay, let me try and uh, uh, ask you uh, a slightly different question. I would presume that you had taken care of some of these efficiencies by virtue of your quarter two numbers and the dissection that people did. My question is, do you reckon demand? Uh, you already mentioned that this is the peak season. My, 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 what I wonder is, in your conversations that you have with your key clients, do you sense demand already having come back or likely to come back uh, as we speak? I see increasing demand, increasing inquiries. Uh, there is uh, uncertainty uh, also that I see uh, in the minds of the consumers. Uh, and that is where I say that people hold back sometimes, even and uh, even if they hold it back for some time, maybe 15 days, uh, 10 days, eventually when the inventories are low, they can't hold it back. Then they have to work on the existing prices. And th those existing prices, I have already given you factors that determine it. And uh, we, we remain reasonable with respect to the markets. Uh, we do not uh, try to uh, over, uh, speculate on either side. Got it. No, but Mr. Jan, I'm still sorry, but I'm still just trying to understand one small thing here. Uh, the 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 narrative around demand in India is is not quite clear. In that, while the government capex has been on uh, question marks over whether that can continue, and road capex certainly has come off uh, from whatever little we pick up. 
Uh, clearly, growth is not looking all that strong if the IIP data recently is to be believed. And I would suspect it's not a flash in the pan. There are some reasons for the numbers to shape up the way they are. So my question is, but there is uh, there is capex happening on PLI schemes, select sector. There is capex happening at defense, um, so on and so forth. So I'm just trying to understand: is demand looking strong? So why don't we look at another surrogate factor, Niraj? Sure. And uh, that surrogate factor happens to be the real number in terms of GST collections. Do you see GST collections going down or going up? If it is going up, there is something that is happening on the demand side, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, fortunately for India now, there is a surrogate measure that is available in the form of uh, GST collections. And this tells us very clearly where India is headed. And India is headed in a far more positive trajectory than any other large economy in the world. Which I agree. I was just wondering, relative to what has already happened, can demand still stay buoyant or no? But I, you it would go up uh, because of the underlying factors. Like every year, there is seasonality due to two major factors. And two of them are at least coincident. Uh, one is monsoons, which also bring with it certain disruptions in the supply chain, floods, etc. The second is the festive season, which also coincidentally starts with the monsoons, you know, with the Savan season and thereafter, you know, one after another, there are uh, there are these festivals, whether it is Ganesh Chaturthi or there will be so 10 days out in western part of the world, Durga Puja, then eastern part of the world goes out, Diwali, the whole country, uh, at least large part of the yeah. country goes out, Chhat Puja. All this uh, keeps happening every year. So... We shouldn't be surprised. Like in uh, Europe, if you see Western Europe, the same thing would start now, just next week. From 20th onwards, nobody would be putting any demand. Because yep. on 5th of January, the demand is not returning. The people are shutting it down. So, you know, you can approximately predict that uh, Christmas will come on 25th of uh, December every year. But still people look surprised after that that, oh, my God, we didn't account for it in our planning, etc. Fortunately, I don't get surprised by any of these events. Okay. Okay, so let's work with an assumption that demand is out there. I have two or three more questions. Uh, in, in light of uh, a strong season or a strong seasonality factor and hopefully a buoyancy in demand scenario, how would your operational metrics shape up? I heard you mention that if raw material cost firm up, it will put a base to the steel prices themselves. But we know that raw material prices were on a tear. And presumably, to the good fortune of you as well as your peers, they may have moderated a little bit in order to give you breathing space on the margin front. What's your sense about how Q3 and Q4 shape up, Mr. Jha? So there is uh, a difference that will be there between the way markets will shape up and where GSP may shape up because okay. of one critical factor that is changing for us within next quarter and which is opening of the mines next door. So there will be these coal mines that will open up uh, after we get the EC clearances and all that. And that brings down our cost of non-coking coal quite dramatically. Which means the cost of power, the cost of uh, uh, DRI, etc., in Angol will go down. So this is a factor which is going to be different from what anybody else would be experiencing in the industry because there is no step change happening. So when we are talking about any of these factors, we have to look at each company's uh, dynamics. And uh, the pointer that I gave you was just on one factor, which is the energy cost into the system. So uh, take your pick from demand side, take your pick from the general supply side you know, for raw materials, but also uh, do factor in a little bit of individual company situations. Yeah, most certainly. Okay. And in your case, a uh, couple of points work out. I mean, in, even in Q2, while it was a difficult quarter for more steel companies, your discipline around uh, leverage 
was very, very evident. Uh, it's been there now for a while, Mr. Jha, I have to say that. Uh, how do you see that piece of the puzzle shaping up over the course of the next 12 to 18 odd months? Would you want to maintain? Would you want, because you might also want to do some CapEx uh, considering the cycle we may be in. How do you think that shapes up? So we have constantly maintained that on the existing investments, we want to eventually become debt free. But this does not uh, mean that if we are such an efficient player, that we would not invest in our future. And in fact, we would not be uh, liked by our shareholders if we were not investing a company that is efficient and is very disciplined about its cash flow is not uh, investing in its future and growth because that is where the share markets really price the growth uh, into the pricing. So uh, we would be, we have, first of all, made a structure where there is a uh, JSP, which is the parent company, like a holding company. And a lot of investment is coming into uh, our uh, Jindal Steel Orisa for Angul side, I'm just talking um, that that company would be obviously borrowing money. And the parent is stronger and stronger to make sure that there is war chest available. And this is the model that we are going to work with. So it allows us to expand and allows us to remain strong and fiscally prudent uh, at a parent company holding level. So I, I hope that uh, you know this z uh, zero net debt uh, is sometimes confused as if at the overall company level, we will not be borrowing at all. No, that is not true because we have also said 1.5x will be our debt to EBITDA cap. Now, when we are saying 1.5x debt to EBITDA cap, that means we are talking about borrowing, right? Because if I look at my uh, current uh, level of net debt, it is around 7,000 crores only, which is less than uh, my EBITDA. So it is it is around, at around 0.6 level. So I have headroom, and I'm going to use that headroom for the future growth. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, you've done Monet. You might do some other acquisitions related, uh, mainstream or otherwise. So I was wondering as to <clears throat> what would happen to that ratio as a result of some of these ambitions that you may have. Uh, and that's why my question. Monet pays for itself within months. For example, we have around 20-25% efficiency gain as a result of using a 525 megawatt into two, uh, you know, this power unit as against 135 into six that we have. So the moment we have this kind of a leverage, we shouldn't let it go from our hands because it pays for itself in less than a year's time. And why shouldn't we do that? Uh, that also means that we can fund for these kind of acquisitions from within the resources that the company is generating in the process of on, ongoing business. It's less than half of a monthly EBITDA level uh, that, that this asset has been acquired. Even if we spend uh, between 1,500 to 2,000 crores over the next couple of years, to make sure that this plant is operational. This also is a small number compared to the gains that we would have. And then add to that the fact that coal mines are next door. That means the cost of power will be the cheapest power in the country. And that is the power that we would not be purchasing from outside. Today, we are purchasing at more than six rupees uh, per unit. This will be much less than two rupees per unit. So that's a huge gain. And it pays for itself within no time. So why wouldn't we do that? Yeah, well, so Mr. Jha, final question. I mean, there are plenty of sweeteners in store, right? I mean, volume growth has been on track. Captive coal mines, as you just mentioned, operational from Q4, a lot of self-sufficiency in, 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 you know, in, your, in your thermal coal, um, etc. How do you suspect the numbers shape up? I'm not asking you to give me exact numbers, but... You know, maybe a bit upper ton, does it move to about 12,500 by, by starting FY24 as an average or anything else that you may have as an internal target? So, first of all, I don't give forward-looking statements. So, you are right. I, I just refrain from it because 
uh, of multiple reasons. Uh, I don't want to mislead anybody. Uh, steel market is cyclical. It is unpredictable. Uh, giving any forward-looking statement is not in the best uh, interest of shareholders. They have access to multiple other sources of information to take an informed view. And therefore, as a company and as a policy, uh, I do not prefer to give even approximate numbers around these. Uh, however, I do uh, see as my responsibility to give pointers towards what uh, are the factors of improvement in our efficiency and i have given that uh, what are the if there are any changes that we are bringing about in our product mix that gives a pointer uh, without giving the exact numbers i think these are the right kind of things that i can share with you and uh, allow the shareholders to make their own uh, assessment based on our statements and these statements can be quantified but we wouldn't like to quantify uh, it for uh, for everybody, uh, lest we make any mistakes on uh, uh, on giving anybody a misleading statement. Fair policy. Or maybe we'll talk the numbers once your Q3 results come out to try and get some sense of how the year is shaping up. But this was insightful. Uh, Mr. Jha, thank you so much for taking the time out and giving us some thoughts on the industry and on JSPL. Thank you, Mr. Shah. Pleasure talking to you. Likewise, viewers, thanks for tuning in to this leg of BQ Conversations.